<laughs> well, uh, this is a grand celebration today. Thank you very much for bringing the program and the cake and the ice cream for your 89th birthday. Happy birthday. Let's give put a hand. And uh, do we have any first timers or visitors? I know we have some uh, visitors here. Will you, uh, well, why don't you introduce Here, here. Here, here. Here, here. here. I'm um, Carrie. I'm Cliff's daughter. And you'll meet, I guess, you'll meet you in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> my brother Dan. You'll meet him in a minute. My daughter Jordan. Uh, my and niece Gita. My niece Callie. Our friend Lynn. And my son Josh. And your mother. And my mother. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, after all, mother is the most important. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Uh, anyone else? Did I have somebody over here? I, I suspect this guy is a Marine. <laughs> Hi, fellas. Great to be back. Uh, great to see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, I'm Roy Flynn's grandson, and I uh, got the pleasure of coming and visiting all you fellas a few times when I was in active, active duty in the service. Uh, I've been out for six years now. It's great to be back. It's great to see all of you. Thanks for letting me join you. It's a real honor to be here. Hoorah. You know, once a Marine, always a Marine. Thank you very much. Come again. So I very carefully opened them up and found some negatives. 
And these negatives must have been in the box, which was dated 1943. So I searched around and finally found a uh, company over in St. Paul that would scan these negatives. And I printed them out and gave them to Bob. And they are a variety of pictures, which he did bring today, but I'll get him to share with you in a future trip of showing him with all of the combat A-26s that he flew in. There are pictures of him up in the cockpit, of sitting on the propeller, standing by the nose gear, and a variety of other uh, ones that Bob had not seen uh, for 60, 70 some odd years. So that's my story. I'll stick to it. And uh, I'm glad that you know, all the old years has told me about this group, and it's the first time I've had the occasion to come. And uh, thank you, and I appreciate meeting everybody here. Thank you. Come soon again. Any others? Our president, Steve Marks, has uh, an announcement. Just a reminder that we have a board meeting after uh, our presentation today. It'll be short. Okay. Uh, I wanted to announce next week's program will be Jeff Patton, Lieutenant Colonel in the, on, uh, that's on active duty with the Air Force, son of Don Patton, and uh, he'll be here next week. You'll uh, get another treat next week. Neither Parker will, or I will be here, and so our president, <laughs> Steve Marks, will, will be the MC. so uh, you'll get a great relief. Uh, it's, it's more relief not having Parker here than me. <laughs> I'll get you for that. If there aren't any other announcements, uh, Dick Hill, you want to introduce our program? Oh, roll? Okay. Our program today is Cliff Diggory, and he is attracting people from all over Minneapolis to come in here and is going to be emceed by his son, Daniel. Thank you, Roald. Um, and I, 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 Roald, I want to give you a special thanks for all the support and help that you've given us in arranging this thing. Roald, we found out, is a, is a, after he spent a Saturday afternoon with us, he became the oldest cousin in my family. So uh, we're very happy to have a man like Roald Knudsen in the family. Thank you, Roald. Um, our program is a little different than we had originally planned. In addition to my father being here today, we had, uh, we had expected uh, retired uh, Lieutenant Colonel William T. Robertson, who was a lead pilot in the 8th Air Force, uh, to be here. And Friday morning we got a phone call. His flight was due in uh, Friday afternoon. We got a phone call. And he, uh, Thursday night, about 10.30, uh, he went out to check his mail one last time before he boarded the plane Friday morning, fell and dislocated his shoulder, uh, and ended up spending several days in the hospital. So uh, we're wishing uh, 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 Robbie a uh, speedy recovery, and we hope to bring him back up here again soon to uh, share this, uh, some of his great stories. What we're going to do today is, uh, my father wrote this book a couple years ago, Into Life School. And this book is based on a diary, and I'll let, I'll let Cliff describe a little bit to you about why he wrote the book and, and a little bit about the title of the book. And I know he doesn't need the microphone, and some of you know that too. But <laughs> I'm still going to uh, give him an opportunity to use it. Do I really need it? I think my voice projects quite well. It's, a, it's not you so much as for me to be able to hear you better. <laughs> okay, how's that? Great. That, okay? Yes. All right, so that's where we start, huh? So tell, tell us a little bit about why you wrote the book and what the book is based on. Well, I, when I went into the military, my sister gave me a diary. And she said, I know you're going to have some interesting experiences, and I'd love to have you keep a recording of all of it. So I did. I was very conscientious about it, kept recording everything we did, and including all my missions. So when I got home, then my, my uh, 
uh, daughter, uh, my children got into the book, and they insisted that Grandpa write this out in a story. So I worked on it for a long, long time, and that's the fruit of it. It's titled Into White School. It's from my high school class motto, which was out of school life into school life. And I graduated from Hendricks High School in 1941. And boy, if anybody had, all of you were in life school at that time in the military. So. And just to give us a little context of your time in the service and your time in the 8th Air Force, can you give us just a, 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 the, the basic dates that you were there and also uh, the, uh, the uh, bomb group that you were assigned and the squadron? It's the group I was with? Yeah. Well, I, at first I was inducted at Fort Snelling, went to basic training in Lincoln, Nebraska, then I was on to uh, uh, to radio school in Camp Kohler, California. I was washed out of the cadet program because I'm colorblind. Then I uh, was stuck into the Signal Corps and I insisted on getting back to the Air Corps and so it was off to Las Vegas, Nevada for gunnery school. And that's where I, that's when I got back to the Air Corps. Okay, so... Um, From there on. From there on, we went to Florida for our uh, crew assignment. Many of you went through the crew assignment. And uh, that's when I was assigned to the William T. Robbie Robertson crew. And one of the very most fortunate things that ever happened to me, because Robbie was one heck of a pilot, and uh, he had been a flying sergeant, actually. And he, had, he enlisted when he was about 17 years old. And so he was in the Air Corps before, before Pearl Harbor. So I was lucky, 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 because he had flown many, many aircrafts. And he had a unique way of picking his crew. Uh, most crews, they, they, they first gave the pilot a list of names, says, here's your crew. And Robert said, that's not for me. I want to interview every member that's on my crew. So he went around to all of the he got three names for each position. So he came around and sat down with us and interviewed every one of us to, to put together his crew. And we did have an outstanding crew. And yeah, Bob, what you are? Yeah, that's good. Um, I want to just go back. You were in, uh, your induction was at Fort Snelling on May 11th, 1943. And I just want to read a little bit about uh, one of your stories from boot camp before we get uh, we get over to Europe. Um, let's see. Okay. So you're inducted now, and then uh, shortly thereafter, you do your basic training at uh, the Lincoln Air Base in Lincoln, Nebraska. Right. Okay, so now I'm going to, I'm going to tell, uh, I'm gonna read a little story about Duncan's Dirty Ditch. Okay. <laughs> okay, and then I'll let you elaborate a little bit on that. So, <clears throat> when it was built, Duncan's Dirty Ditch had been named with a bit of satire. I'm sure for General Duncan, the commanding officer of the Lincoln Air Base. The ditch was an open, open drainage ditch approximately 20 feet wide and 12 to 15 feet deep. It was right in front of our barracks and ran several blocks through the heart of the base. Apparently it had been built to drain water, but, but now no water was running. The bottom was covered with a mucky green slime, perhaps two or three feet deep, which emitted a horrible stench and was said to be infested with rodents, lizards, and snakes. Well, this ditch became the center stage on a hot, late June Saturday afternoon. So do you want to uh, finish the rest of the story? Okay. Uh, they, for some reason, I have no idea why, they came to the nurse and said, fall out in, in your fatigues. So we did. And we were off to a farmer's field to pick mustard. A great big field of mustard. We were all out there picking up this mustard, hot, sweaty, cursing every minute of it. Well, we came back, 
after, oh, I don't know, four or five hours of picking mustard. And here were three of the guys who had hidden when we fell out. And they were uh, smuggling in their bunks, just kind of laughing at us. Well, that just set the whole tone. There was no way that we were, they were going to just get by with that. So each guy was pulled out of his bunk. And he said, you're going for a ditch in Duncan's ditch. <laughs> and so each guy was pulled out one by one and brought down to Duncan's ditch. Except this Engstrom from, he's from northern Minnesota. He was, a, he was a fighter. He was a boxer. And he said, I'm not going. And he hung onto his bunk for dear life. Well, there's no way he was going to get by with that. So they took him out physically and threw him into the ditch. And he, he just mucked down into this crap of snakes and rats and it. Finally, he came, coming out, heaving his guts out and going up to the shower to wash it off. The moral that I put to that story, never, never screw your buddies. And that never happened again, I'll tell you. <laughs> Well, going over to Europe might, it might not seem so bad after that, too. Um, okay, so then you, you, uh, you, you mentioned that you went to the Signal Corps um, and radio school, and then you went to gunnery school in Las Vegas. Right. And uh, so you, were, uh, you went into service in May of 43, so now you're, you're in gunnery school starting in January of 44. And I'm going to just read a little bit about your, your assignment. Um, you were assigned to the ball turret, um, and you wrote, it, it was also in the classroom setting that I was first introduced to the ball turret. When I knew I would be an aerial gunner on a bomber, I was certain I would be a ball turret gunner. And why was that? Because of my size, I weighed about 130 pounds. My weight that was there, my, size, my height, I was ideal for the ball turret. In the classroom, we had an operating ball turret, and we could visually see how everything functioned. The ball was truly a ball shape, except for two protruding 50 uh, caliber guns and the flat, small, round window we viewed our targets through. The turret rotated 360 degrees in the azimuth and 90 degrees vertically. Since I knew my responsibility on a crew would be the ball turret, I wanted to learn everything possible about it. By the end of our six weeks of school, I knew the functioning of it as well as the two guns the turret employed. I, I wanted to be sure, because I was sure that, like I said, that I wanted to know everything about it. And on two of our missions, my, my diligence to learn about the ball turret paid off a big time. Because on two of our missions, I, I kind of came to the rescue of the ball turret guns. Okay, we'll get to those missions here in just a minute. Um, so then you go on to Tampa, Florida for the crew assignments. And uh, let, me, uh, let me read just a little bit about that. Having passed these tests, next was the suspense of being assigned to the right crew, knowing that the skills of my pilot and the other crew members would likely be a matter of life or death. Most crews were put together with clerks pulling out the names of pilots, co-pilots, nav navigators in a random, more or less, order. Just the luck of the draw. But this was not going to be the way our crew was put together. One day, returning to the barracks after playing a baseball game, I found a note on my bunk that a Lieutenant Robertson had stopped to see me and that he would be back at such and such a time. I had no idea what this was all about, but I was certain I was not in trouble since I was a conscientious old soldier, always playing by the rules. So I waited, and almost exactly at the time noted, he came back and introduced himself as First Lieutenant William T. Robertson, bomber crew pilot. So do you want to t tell us what happened then? Well, Roger sat down with me and started asking me about my home, my hobbies, my family, and he wanted to seem to know everything about me. And he was a, I could tell he was a good listener, and when he left, I was hoping he would choose me to be on his crew. He said in the beginning, 
He said, I don't want just an ordinary crew. I want the best crew that the Air Force has ever had. And that's the way it did turn out. But he, uh, he was, and so when I was chosen to be on this crew, I felt very fortunate. And I wish he was here today, and he would probably tell you something about how he, how he chose the guys for our crew. Most of them had been instructors, and, and, or good students in their work. And he picked me because I had done well in radio school, and I was going to be an assistant radio operator in the Vulture, and I had done well, well all the way through. So I was pleased that he picked me. Thank you, Ronnie. By the way, this has been video, so I'm going to send it on to Robbie after it's over with. All right, I'm sure he'll enjoy this. Um, your crew, um, you uh, you had a you had a crew. Your your pilot was William T. Robertson. Your co-pilot was Clifford Hendrickson, and he was from Jasper, Indiana. Our navigator was Elmer Bankton from Virginia. Our uh, bombardier was Charlie Carberry from New York City. Our top turret gunner was uh, Earl Reinhardt from Romney, Indiana. Our radio operator was Bernie Stuckman from Philadelphia. I was in the ball turret. Our waste gunners were Stanley Sadlowski from Massachusetts, who, by the way, we became the best friends. He was even the best man at my wedding. And our other waste gunner was Julius Kornblatt from New York City, and our kill gunner was John Brown from New York City. That made up the William T. Roddy Robertson crew. So uh, you, you train together as a crew, and you're training now in May through July of 1944. Of course, uh, uh, June 6th was D-Day of that year. Um, then, during your training, while you were at MacDill Airfield in Tampa, you had a uh, memorable experience. Do you want to tell us about that? I will indeed. Most all of you have heard of the Memphis Bell, but how many here have flown the Memphis Bell? <laughs> Robbie seemed the Memphis Bell was back after the after his tour of duty in England, and it was stationed at uh, McDill Field for a time being. And Robbie seemed to sense that it was going to be famous, so he, he scheduled a plane one night. He said, no passes tonight, guys. He didn't tell us why. He said, we're going to take a special flight. So we went to the, to the runways, got it, we all climbed it. Well, as we saw, here's the Memphis Bell. My God, we've all heard of that. So it flew up to, I think it was Cleveland or Chicago. I got that in there. Um, and uh, it took time to have every single member of the crew come up and sit at the controls and so they could someday say, I flew the Memphis Bell. And I did. So I'm proud of that. <laughs> so then in uh, August of 1944, uh, August 14th through August 19th, you're in transit going to England. Do uh, you have any uh, recollections of that period of time? What, was, uh, what you were thinking? What was going through your head as you're uh, heading over there? Yes, we, went, we took, went by train from, from uh, Tampa to uh, Savannah, Georgia, picked up a brand new B-17. How many flew over on their planes? See, there was quite an experience. We flew from uh, uh, Savannah up to Bangor, Maine, and then we flew to uh, uh, Goose Bay, Labrador, and as we, when we got uh, left Goose Bay, we were perhaps a half an hour out, and we had a complete power failure. So we had to turn around, go back to uh, to Labrador, and have that fixed. And while they did that, but Roddy and the co-pilot co took a little snooze, so they were better shape. Got our plane back, and we flew to Reykjavik, Iceland. From Reykjavik, Iceland, we flew on to Bang to Valley, Wales, where we dropped our plane off, make it combat ready. They put in the armament and so on like that. And then from Valley Wales, we went by train up to, uh, up to Peterborough, England, where we uh, were based, our station was at Glatton, 457th Bomb Group, Glatton, England. 
Now there are some other 457th members here today, aren't there? Um, Dick Kaminsky. Dick Raleigh. Raleigh, yeah. So you're all stationed at Glad. Yeah. I think there are, I think there are three or four members of this association that are from the 457th. You were in what uh, squadron? Oh, I was in the 749 squadron. How about you, Raleigh? Seven fiftieth, I think. And Dick Kaminsky was in the seven fiftieth. I was in the seven forty-eight. Oh, you're a seven forty-eight. Okay. There are seven forty-eight, forty-nine, fifty, and fifty-first. So uh, that's mid-August, and and uh, you did some training between then and September eighth, nineteen forty-four. And that was your that was the night before your first mission. So your first mission is on September 9th, 1944. What was going through your head on September 8th, 1944? Well, the, the night before the first mission, it was, it was quite somber, you know. It wasn't very wondering what to expect, what's going to happen to me. And I would say that we were pretty had some pretty rough missions to begin with. But I remember everybody was in a very, writing letters home in, in a very somber mood. So because tomorrow you're going to fly your first mission, you'll find out what this real flight is like, you'll find out what fighters are like. So it was different. So mission number one was to Mannheim, Germany, target the marshalling yards. Um, the official results, at least at that point, were unknown. And the, the plane you flew was, you'll never know. Um, your, your diary journal entry that day starts with the biggest highlight, we made it. We were awakened at 0300 hours, first on to breakfast, then to trucks, uh, by trucks to briefing. At briefing, we learned what the target would be, the routes to and from the target, and that we should expect moderate to heavy flak, that we could expect German fighters to attack us after bombs away that there would be heavy cloud cover in the target area, and that the length of the mission would be just over seven hours and 30 minutes. After briefing, Protestant and Catholic chaplains held a short prayer and benediction service. Did you go to that? Indeed I did. <laughs> I, I never missed a single one. And uh, one of the missions, I can tell this now, our Jewish friend, Judy Kornblatt, came to me and said, CB, they called me CB by, by the enlisted men and Cliff by the officers. Said, so CB, how about putting in a good word for me? And I said, Julie, come along in, uh, into the great in the meeting with me. I said, I'd rather not, but I just wonder if you would say a little prayer for me. And of course, I assured him I would. We had a liar flag, and it was a rough mission, but we were not injured. Nobody was injured on our crew, but we did run into a lot of flak. So, as you remember, that first one of flak was yeah, scary as hell. So, um, on to mission three. That was September twelfth. Uh, September tenth. Mission two was September September tenth. You know, I have learned that if I make any mistakes, <laughs> even if I've got the book and the writing in front of me, I, I've got to be really careful because, as you can see, this guy doesn't forget anything, anything. So I'm going to I'm going to skip if it's okay. Mission two, and I'm going to move on to mission three. Mission two was what? Maybe I'm not going to skip mission two. <laughs> Mission two was rough, rough, rough. We went to Bang Bang, Germany. And there our our bombardier was shot up at this rear end of a flag. Pretty bad. He was out of commission for several weeks. So that was the start of our injuries. Now we go to mission three. Okay, good. Okay, so mission number three was what day was that again? Mission three? To Roulette. Okay, and it's on September 12th, a uh, synthetic rubber plant. And your airplane is the same plane you had on mission number two, which was? Rattlesnake Daddy. That was our nemesis. That plane cost us more problems than any other plane we flew. So you wrote in your diary, this is one day I shall never forget, no doubt the saddest day of my young life. 
Our engineer at nearing top gunner, Earl Reinhardt, died of anoxia when his oxygen hose was cut by shrapnel from flag. We were perhaps 30 to 40 minutes from the target when we were first hit by a light but accurate flag. When we passed the flag pocket, Robbie called for an oxygen check, starting with tail gunner, okay, waist gunner, okay, ball turret gunner, okay, radio operator, okay, and then no answer from top turret. Earl's intercom had been intermittent, so Robbie asked that we turn, turn the turret if he was okay. Still no response. So co-pilot Cliff Hendrickson left his seat and went back to Earl. He was still standing upright in his turret position, but when Hendrickson gave a, tight, a slight tug to his trouser, trousers, he slumped down. He was completely unconscious, and when Cliff saw the severed oxygen hose, he knew what had happened. Cliff, with Elmer Mankin's help, brought him up to the nose. They loosened his clothing and put him on pure oxygen. While Elmer was working on Earl, we were struck by a fierce fighter attack consisting of an estimated 50 fighters, mostly ME-109s and FW-190s, as well as new jet-propelled fighters. At one instant, I saw three B-17s hit and going down end over end in flames. And from those three planes, I saw only three parachutes open. It was a horrible sight, one that I shall never forget. Our group lost a total of 28 men that day, either killed or missing in action. Yeah, that was one rough mission. It was to Rudeman, Germany, and it, it started us off. This is only mission number three. We've already had one guy shot up. Now we got one killed. How in the hell are we ever going to get through 30 missions or whatever we were to fly? So, yes, that was a tough one, Daniel. But you stayed, you had stayed in touch with, uh, with Earl's family, is that right? Shortly after I got out of the service, yes, my sister started to write to them even before that. And then shortly after the military, they came to Minnesota to see us, and we became very, very good friends. And to this day, I'm still in touch with the Reinhardts. And one of their, one of Earl's nephews lives in Little Canada, I think, isn't it, Daniel? And we're in touch with him on a regular basis. So Earl was one heck of a guy, just an incredible person and an incredible engineer. So now we're on to mission number seven, September 26th. <laughs> Six hours and 45 minutes to Osnabrück, Germany, marshalling yards. And your airplane again on mission number seven was? Rattlesnake Daddy. So uh, this was also a memorable uh, mission. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Uh, next mission, our radio operator, Bernie Stutman, his power has electric suit failed, and he had no electricity, and by now, Reinhardt had been replaced by an engineer, and he neglected to put a spare heater suit in the in the plane which was supposed to have, and, and so uh, Stuntman went through the entire mission with no seat. And that night, he uh, sat. I remember him sitting and rubbing his leg and saying, "Geez, I think I got some terrible frostbite." So he's just rubbing. He said, "If we don't fly tomorrow, I'm going to go and uh, go on sick call." because he hadn't reported it. So I go on and tell the rest of that. So then, several years after the war, Stuttman got in touch with me. And he said, Cliff, I know you kept the diary. He said, do you have a recording of the day I got my frostbite? And I said, I sure do. Well, I said, since I hadn't been on sick call, I didn't get any, I, I saw it on radio records. He said, would you verify that? And I said, of course I will. And by so doing that, he got service connected. He ended up, listen to this, losing both his legs and an arm. He really suffered. That's my boy for his time. So uh, my diary is paid off there, I'll prove it. And to this day, we are touch with the Stuntman family, as you know, Dave. Okay, let's uh, move on to mission number 10. No, let me, let me go on to mission 7 again. On the way, uh, when we thought we were out of flight, uh, we went back to uh, 
February 19, when we thought we were completely out of flat. Oh, and, oh, that day, my good friend Siglowski, who flew in the waste position, said, I want to fly in the ball turf today, CB. I said, okay, I'll trade with you. Well, he went in the ball turf. Now, this is one of my examples of, of how my knowledge of the ball turf paid off. And uh, just when we thought we were out of flag, uh, the plane went, uh, we got a burst right under our plane. And somehow, Robbie put the plane into a dive. Whether he did it to avoid more flak or what, I'm not sure. And I, if you were here, we'd talk about that. But uh, in so doing, the power failed in the ball turned. So Sid Austin screams out, I have no power. And many of you know the ball turned. Once they, in the B-17, once the door is out of the plane, you have no way of getting out of there because it was too small for a parachute, at least it was for me. And so Sid Lowski was trapped in the wall, and he screams out, see me, I'm trapped, I can't get out. Well, I knew just exactly where the handle was, so I went for the handle and cranked the ball turb until he got out of the ball turb. And that night, Sid Lowski gave me a, a ruby ring, which he, he said with me so loud to me, he said, I've never known a friend like you. I thank you, CB. Okay, mission 10. Mission 10, oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> Mission 10, October 5th, 1944, uh, to Cologne, Germany, marshalling yards and Ford Motor Plant. Uh, and your airplane, once again, on mission 10. Ram State <laughs> By the way, uh, we we're out to see Rand, uh, uh, Bernie Stutman and his, his, uh, uh, his son Randall a couple years ago. They had a race car, they had a demolition derby. And Randall knew that CB was coming out for this. So you can imagine what they painted up one of the cars to look like and put the name on that, that car. And everybody was cheering for that car to get banged up something here, so. <laughs> yeah. So mission turned out to be nine days of super highlights and unbelievable adventures. I shall never forget. That's a pretty long mission for a, uh, for a six or seven hour mission. Here's the story. I'll read this first part and then you can elaborate on the details that you can say in front of my mother. <laughs> the day started out routine enough with our wake up call at approximately 0400 hours, on to breakfast, next to briefing and onto our planes. Take off and assembly over England went without incident. We entered the continent at the Belgian coast, heading to our target, Cologne, a dreaded target, always a heavy concentration of flak. About 50 miles into Germany, our armament gunner, Sidlowski, had just come out of the bomb bay after pulling the bomb pins when the number four engine started to run rough and Robbie had to feather it. With a near maximum bomb and gas load, there was no way we could keep up with the formation. Robbie came on the intercom and said, fellows, we have no choice. We will have to turn around and go home alone without fighter escort, so be alert. And he added, we don't dare drop our bombs since we are not certain where the front lines are. Within minutes, number one engine was running rough and had to be feathered too. Now with only our two inboard engines, we were losing altitude at 700 feet a minute, and we were not certain of our location. Were we in enemy territory or not? Robbie alerted us that we might need to abandon the plane and bail out, or we might need to prepare for a belly landing. In either event, we were told to come out. I was told to come out of the ball turret and take over the waste gun position while Sid went back into the bomb bay to put the pins back in the bomb so they could be dropped without detonating. Suddenly, Carberry burst out. There's an airfield at 10 o'clock. It was just on the edge of the city. Robbie said, what's the city, Carberry? And I could still hear CW's joking response, God, Robbie, I don't know, it could be Paris, maybe Brussels, but my calculations say it's Antwerp. And he was right on, it was Antwerp, Belgium. So you want to tell us a little bit more of that story? Okay, so now we see, uh, we see water, which was the estuary to the North Sea. So we got over there, we're down to about 300 feet. So right there, uh, yeah, I decided we could drop the bombs here. So we fly over this water and we drop the bombs. 
safely into the, into the estuary. I'm sure they're still there. The people of Antwerp would fire right over the city, and they think, we're going to be bombed again. And they're as scared as could be about that, Gilbert. We learned this from citizens afterwards. Then we started back for the base that we'd seen, which was an air base, a runner strip. Not very long, not very long. So, uh, and just as we came, came there, we saw Flock Wolf 190 and ME 109s on the runway, but they had been abandoned by the Germans who had evacuated the base two days before. But then we saw some Spitfires taking off, so we knew we were in friendly territory. As it turns out, the base had been liberated just about two or three days before this time. So we made a safe landing, an incredible landing. We had one engine out, another engine on fire. You might read that commendation that Robbie got there, Daniel, from, from the commanding officer of the base. The base had now been taken over by the Canadian First Army, Air Force, and uh, what's it? They were in touch with that, uh, with us there, and they brought us into the base. I, I don't know if you find that or not. Well, well, I'm looking for it. Tell us what you did in, I mean, I can't imagine what you could possibly do in, uh, in uh, Belgium for nine days. <laughs> well, first of all, and that was incredible. And there's a commendation in there that the commanding officer of this base wrote about Robbie. What an incredible landing he had made. And uh, we went up to the, we, uh, we got out of the plane, and there was a bunch of Polish so soldiers there, and they called Sidlowski from Massachusetts, our crew, crew member, and he spoke fluent Polish. So he was honored to be the spokesman for us, telling what we're doing here. So then they brought us up to the uh, mess hall, fed us, and brought us into town. Now, what, how much do you want me to elaborate there? Well, I think tell, yeah, well, not that much, but tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about what Robbie did for his crew. I thought that was, a, that tells a lot about what kind of guy he was. Okay. Then they, we were brought into the city of Tampa. There's a luxury hotel called the Century Hotel. There's a hotel of the ambassadors. Well, they had dropped off the officers there, and they stayed there. They took their listed men to the city jail. And here they said, here's where you will be quartered. Well, I, uh, we sat, we went into the jail, got our bunks, and Bernie Stuckman, who was bitter about being washed out of the cadet program anyway, said, to hell with this noise. And he just got, got up, went up to the Century Hotel, brought Robbie back, and Robbie said, pick up your gear, boys. And so he brought all of us up to this luxury hotel that was supposed to be for officers only. I think it's interesting how he got us in there. He told the term, these are all officers. Every one is officers. Some are commissioned, some are not commissioned. But nevertheless, all officers. And with that, we were all put up there. And it's a century. We were there for nine days. Wow, did we have a time. Okay, well, the rest we'll leave out because my mother and, and sister are here, um, and also our, our children, you know, so. Um, okay. Yeah, let us, uh, do we have time for one more mission? Okay, let's do one more mission. I thought mission 20, which is probably one of your, another one of your interesting missions. So you want to tell us about that? Well, after, Rodney made the beat pilot. And so we were washed off, many of us. So we had another crew there for me. And that crew went down. I was supposed to fly with them on December 19th, 1944. And for some reason, they pulled me off the crew, and they went down, and all were killed, except one guy. I read it up in the book. Now, what were you talking about? You're going to tell us about Mission 20. This is the one with the, uh, the new crew. So now I don't fly for many weeks. Finally, I am assigned to the 748th, your squadron, to fly with Tommy Thompson. Holy cow, what a pilot. Uh, they got me up at the last minute because their radio operator, they said, got sick, so I was going to fly with the radio operator. Now we, uh, 
We were just got on board. I didn't have breakfast or a darn thing. And Tommy comes out and says, Radio operator, sorry I didn't get to meet you. He said, this is my eighth mission and I've had four crash landings. I said, thank you, sir. I'm on my 20th and I don't need any more excitement. <laughs> Guess what? We fell in that in France. <laughs> Again, my knowledge of the ball turf paid off. The dumb crew, like some of the crew were kind of, not all that way about it. They didn't know how to drop the ball turf. They, they loosened the force bolts on the top, and then they, you know the ball turf, and uh, they didn't take out the force screws around the gear ring. And they were standing on it, jumping on it, if it had gone, and they had gone right down with it, you know? So I was in the radio room. I looked out and I said, take out the four little screws and the ball will fall down. It's heavy. And that's what happened. It did fall that fighting. Well, then we made a belly landing and I got a picture of that in there with my, with my uh, crew there. I think that's about it, then. say what? There's, uh, there's lots of other good stories, and I, as I've read this book, I, first of all, I was, I was really, as I got to those missions, I was just thinking, God, I hope this guy makes it. <laughs> um, but but I, I think what, what struck me about this is probably not how, how unusual his, his uh, uh, experience was, but probably how typical his experience was through the whole process of it, and I know that many of you went through that too. So... Um, uh, I think it's, it's, in that sense, it's a very, very good book because I think it's sort of an every man's story of, of, of getting through that. Um, do you want to say anything else before we wrap up? No, I, I missed being here with you guys. And now I'm suffering with this oxygen thing because I hit my lungs too hard with, ox, with radiation. But I hope to come whenever I can. But uh, I had a good army career. I, I really did. And I was glad that I get to get to serve. I'm proud of our service. I'm proud of our crew. And I wish my pilot could have been here today. He would have enjoyed this immensely. He was with me in Savannah at our reunion last fall. And he was kind of the star of the show. He told a lot of his stories that he remembered after he made the pilot. So that I'm sorry about. But I guess you got to meet my family here, and I'm proud. My son Daniel runs our company business. I'm proud of everybody, and I'm glad to be here. Thank you for your attention. I, I, there's a lot more there, but we could save that for another time. Okay. Thank you. If you're interested, Roald is having a special book sale up here. We've uh, we've got some hard covers and some saw covers, and they're uh, twenty dollars either way. If you get to the hard covers, that's a good deal on it. So you better get to those first. And the pictures up here are pictures of uh, of Colonel uh, uh, William T. Robertson. If you'd like to see his uh, uh, during war picture, and the other picture on the left is his uh, retirement picture. Okay, yeah.